magistral será dada por el doctor Rod Cohen de la Universidad de Stanford y el título es ¿Cuál es la forma del universo y cómo podemos discernirla? La conferencia será en inglés. Thank you very much. It really is an, um, indeed a pleasure and an honor to be here at this event. Uh, commemorating the life and work of our, of our friend Samuel Hitler. Uh, Samuel was a real mathematical hero of mine. I met him first uh, when I was a graduate student at Brandeis University. Uh, Sam had been a collaborator of my PhD advisor, Ed Brown. Uh, at that time, in the mid-1970s, uh, Brown and Hitler had just done their work on the Brown-Hitler spectrum, which we've heard some about uh, in the last couple of days. Uh, so in, in any case, Sam was around Brandeis quite a bit, and I got to know him well, and indeed, he helped me very much. Moreover, uh, another giant in our field at that time uh, was Mark Mahowal, and at that time, he had used he had just used Brown Gitler spectra in a very unexpected way. And there was really quite a bit of excitement in the topology research community. And I have to say, I spent many, many hours uh, studying the Brown Gitler paper and the Mahowal preprint and uh, a lot of other papers and manuscripts uh, giving background material. And it was pretty tough going. But uh, Sam was always there, he was very helpful. He was always encouraging, uh, he was always energetic, and he showed people of my generation, as well as subsequent generations, his love of mathematics, always in the context of his grace, his elegance, and his wonderful humor. Now, besides being a tremendous help to me mathematically, uh, another thing uh, he did for me, as well as many others, was to introduce me to the Mexican mathematical community. Uh, particularly in our field of topology. I've had the great fortune to connect and to reconnect with my Mexican colleagues and friends, and having this connection to the Mexican mathematics community has really been important to me throughout my career. Uh, it's wonderful to see uh, so many uh, old friends at this meeting, and to pay homage to our common mentor and friend, Samuel Fiedler. Now, when Jesus and Ernesto asked me to uh, speak at this meeting, I thought the best way to honor Sam uh, was not to speak directly about his work. We have, we have heard quite a bit about that in the last couple of days. Uh, and also, I didn't really want to give a technical lecture. But rather, I thought I would uh, try to describe how some of the basic geometric objects that were central in Sam's work, called manifolds, which we've heard a fair bit about, um, and describes how they're relevant in a question that has been of interest to mathematicians, scientists, and philosophers uh, for literally thousands of years. And that is, uh, what is the shape of the universe? Does it have any shape? Does it go on forever? Is it basically flat? Or if there is shape to it, can we measure its curvature? How is it curved? Uh, is it infinite in size, or is it somehow finite in size? And, and, and intriguingly, how can we tell? Now, many of these ideas involve a great deal of imagination, and I actually hope to stretch your imaginations here a little bit, uh, because I believe strongly that geometry and topology, as well as symmetry, beauty, and imagination, are, go together in an intricate way. And this was certainly evidenced by Sam's work throughout his career. Now what we're looking at now is an image from the Hubble Sp Space Telescope. Uh, we're looking at uh, the um, Orion Nebula. A nebula is a cloud um, of gas and dust in which thousands of stars uh, hundreds of thousands of stars are forming. Now notice I used the present tense. They are forming. But right away one has to ask the question, is the present tense appropriate? 
Now, the Orion Nebula is actually uh, a nearby neighbor in galactic terms. It's 1,344 light years away. But what that means is that the light that was emitted in this image was emitted 1,344 years ago. And it arrived at the Hubble Space Telescope and on Earth just recently. It's kind of hard to get your head around. 1,344 years ago, uh, Europe was still in the Middle Ages. So the light that we're looking at here happened all that time ago, but we're just seeing it now. So one obvious consequence is that the universe is huge, and any real discussion about the shape of the universe has to take time into account. It's intricately related in, in size and shape when we're talking at this uh, magnitude of size. So the question, as I say, that we'd like to discuss is what is the shape of the universe? We know it's huge, but is it infinite? Could it somehow be finite in size? This is a, a gentleman named Archidas of Tarentum. He lived in what is now Italy, but in those days it was a part of ancient Greece. He lived about 2,400 years ago. He was a mathematician and philosopher. He was a follower of Pythagoras. He was a contemporary of Plato. He argued that the universe must be infinite. And what was his argument? His argument, is depicted in this uh, picture, is that, well, if the universe, he argued by contradiction, as we often do in mathematics and in philosophy. He argued that if the universe was finite in size, then at least theoretically you could travel to the end of the universe, to its edge, to its boundary, stick your hand or head through that boundary, as this picture shows, and look to see what's on the other side. But isn't what's on the other side part of the universe? So what's wrong with his argument? Or is there anything wrong with his argument? I think mathematically the difficulty in his argument is he equates being finite in size with having an edge or a boundary. And as we'll see, there are many examples of interesting geometric shapes that are finite in size, or in mathematics we call them compact, but with no edge or boundary. So as mathematicians and scientists often do in studying a very difficult and complicated problem, is that you first study a very simplified example, almost what one might call a toy example. So let's imagine a universe that is one-dimensional and has only one inhabitant, this uh, ladybug here. In this case, the universe, I drew a line, and the arrows on the ends of the line mean it's supposed to go on forever. It's one-dimensional, so this ladybug can, not, can look forward, she can turn around and look backwards, but she can't look to the left or right or up or down. One dimension. But it is infinite in size. But what if that universe was curved and had a circular shape? Maybe a very large circular shape. Imagine that that circle had a circumference of, I don't know, 10 light years. And suppose, again in our simplifying assumption, suppose that ladybug had perfect vision. Now, what would she see? Well, she would see in the direction of her universe and so she would see her back. But she would see her back from 10 years ago. Because that's how long it took the light to go around that circle in that universe, back to the point that she could see. Of course, if it was me standing there instead of the ladybug, and I could see, I would see the back of my head 10 years ago, and I'd have a little bit more hair. But um, the ladybug would see herself, her back, and then she would look further on and she would see herself 20 years ago, and 30 and 40 and 50 years ago. So in principle, she would see infinitely many copies of herself. She would have the illusion that there are infinitely many ladybugs in the universe. All right, 
let's jump up to two dimensions and, and imagine that we live on the surface of a torus. This has come up uh, in, in many other uh, talks. So again, the torus is, is, is described by taking a piece of paper like I have here. And uh, the letters there say you identify or glue together the two edges marked A, and you get a cylinder. And then the edges marked B are now circles, and you glue them together as well. Now if I did that with this paper, I'd get kind of a crumpled mess. So th that's what you get up there, that picture there. So let's see if I can figure out how to use this pointer. Uh, and notice that the edges are no longer edges. They are lines or curves on the torus, but they are no longer edges or boundaries. They are circles that intersect each other at a right angle, but they are not finite in size. This is a compact shape. Now, in order to get a feel for the geometry of living on, of what it would be like to live on the surface of the torus, um, well, imagine we were school teachers and wanted to teach our uh, class how to graph a line um, of living on a torus. So let's graph the line y equals 2 thirds x on the torus. So I am um, assuming, I'm thinking of this vertex here as being the origin, and here's the line of slope 2 thirds. And notice that it intersects um, this line, A, at two-thirds of the way up. Now remember, A was glued to that line, mark A. So that line actually intersects, the line of Y equals two-thirds X actually intersects this line, A, as well. It's the same line. And so if we continued the line, it would go like that. And it would intersect the B line right in the middle, which is has been glued to um, this B edge down here. So if we continue, it would go like that. And we continue further, and it would intersect, and we finally hit this vertex again. Now, if you recall, when we made this into the torus and we did this gluing, all of these vertices were identified to a single point. So all four of these points have been glued together and represent a single point. So that point up here is the same as that point here. So it means at this point, this line has come back to where it began. So if you continue the line, it'll just retrace its back itself. So the graph of that line is actually a finite and closed curve. Now we see it as these uh, uh, sort of disjoint pieces in this representation. And I'll show it to you on the torus itself in a second. But let me just point out that this line intersected this A curve three times, and we all have intersected the B curve two times. And that two and the three are what give you the slope of the line two thirds. So if we want to understand this better, we would do what our students would do, which means go to YouTube. So I will go to YouTube, and, and hopefully this video will work. And here's a picture of that very line. It's a little bit uh, big. Um, y equals 2 thirds x graphed on that surface. And you see it's a finite closed curve. This uh, video undoes it. Um, let me uh, do it again. And it will trace out a curve, which is actually an example of a knot, a torus knot. And it's called the trefoil knot. It goes around. Uh, one circle three times and the other circle twice. And you'll see the knot forming. So this is a line on a torus, which is a loop, and it's a knot. So a line is this knot. So that's a rather bizarre concept. Now, you can ask, does every line on a torus form a closed loop? And the answer is no, because if it did, uh, well, well, consider the following case. Consider the case of the graph of y equals mx, where is the slope again, but now the slope is an irrational number, like square root of 2 or pi or something. 
that will never close up, I claim. So let's try to understand why that's true. Again, mathematicians, philosophers, always try to prove their things. So let me give you a sketch of the argument. If it did close up, that means if I continued this line, it would eventually come back to that vertex. And it would intersect the A curve some number of times, some whole number of times. It would intersect the B curve some number of times, and that ratio of those two numbers would give you the slope. The ratio of two numbers is by definition a rational number. So if we start with an irrational number, it won't happen. So what will it look like? Well, again, go to YouTube, and here's a, a, a little movie of an irrational line on a torus. You'll see that it, it takes a moment, but it wraps around itself. It will come close to itself, but it will never close up. One's tempted to think that it actually fills up the entire torus, and that's not quite true. But what is true is that it is dense in the torus. And what that means is that if you put a microscope anywhere in that torus, and no matter how small a region you're looking at in that microscope, you will see part of that yellow line, the line of the irrational slope. So you see, it'll just keep going forever and never intersect itself. Now, actually, um, I have a client out here, but before we do that, I don't, I wanna, I don't want to leave the torus yet. I want to get more of a feel for what life is like, or what the geometry is like on a torus. So let me go to another uh, piece of software. Again, it's what our students would do. Now they would play video games. So let me do, uh, let me play some computer games on the surface of a torus. Let's see if we can get that to work. So um, let's start here for a moment. So here, again, this grid is on the surface of a torus. So again, this edge here has been glued to this edge, the top edge glued to the bottom edge. Now, again, so imagine this is our universe, and there's only one inhabitant, like before, except now it looks like a hand. Oops. And suppose this hand is, uh, looks to the right. And he will look to the right, and notice he does not bounce off an edge here. There's no edge here, unlike what uh, Archidas uh, suggested. But rather, he continues out the other end. So if he had perfect vision, he would look to the right, and he would see his right thumb. Similarly, if he went up, he would see the bottom. So uh, it's a, a rather interesting situation. So this is a piece of software. I will give you uh, the link at the end for some of the, these games and software that I'm going to play with. Um, but it's, it's quite nice that you can play games on the surface of the, oops, the computer's playing tic-tac-toe with me. Um, all right, let me continue. And um, where should I go? Ah, so the computer won. <laughs> Now, you might not think he won, or she won, I don't know what gender a computer is, but you see, that's a line on a torus, right? Because that point here is the same as the glue to that point, and it continues. So, so, so you're playing tic-tac-toe on a torus. I was going to ask my former student, Ernesto, to, to challenge me in a game, but I'd be afraid that he won't, would win. So. I didn't do that. But uh, let's do one, one more uh, example. Let's play pool on the surface of the torus. So here, the, um, again, we're on the surface of the torus. The two edges here have been I, I glued together. The two top and bottom edges have been glued together. And what we'll see is that um, if we aim the pool ball in a certain direction, it will not bounce off an edge here. There's no edge there, but it'll really come out from here because that point and that point are the same. And you see the travel of this golf, golf, 
of this pool ball um, on the surface of Taurus. It's actually kind of difficult to play pool when the geometry is curved like this. All right, let's um, let's go back and um, consider the Klein bottle for a moment. Now we've seen this before in, uh, in several of the talks. So it's, it's, it's created very much like the torus is created. The two edges marked A are glued together, it forms a cylinder, and then you have two circles, and you want to glue them together. But as the arrows indicate, they're in opposite direction. Those two circles need to be identified in opposite orientation. So how do you do that? Well, we've seen that one way to do it um, is to pass the cylinder through itself. So um, let's see if our YouTube video of this will work. I'm a, a little bit skeptical, but maybe. Okay, I think it may work. Yes, I do like that. So here we're forming, and the, the two edges marked A have been glued together, and we have that cylinder. And we continue on. And it stretches, it, it needs to identify those two circles together, but it has to twist it around itself, go through itself, and come up. And if I stop right there, you see those two circles are about to be glued together, but if you think about the path that it has taken, there, the orientations that were originally um, given have been reversed, and it, it forms this uh, so-called Klein bottle, which we've seen before. And uh, again, this is an example of a surface, a manifold, and a, a surface is a two-dimensional manifold, um, that has been immersed in three-dimensional space. It is not embedded. Again, the difference between immersions and embedded and embeddings is that Immersions allow for self-intersection. And it's a theorem that has been stated before that this Klein bottle cannot be embedded in three-dimensional space, but it requires four dimensions to work uh, to embed it. But this is an embedding, and this is an immersion into three space. And as been pointed out many, many times, uh, Sam was uh, one of the world's leading experts on the theory of immersion. All right, let's go back. I can't resist um, playing another uh, video game. Or, um, but now let's work, instead of on the surface of a torus, let's go to the surface of, um, see, we get to change our topology here, to a Klein bottle. And let me go back to that uh, tic-tac-toe grid. And again, now we're in the surface of a Klein bottle. So if we have our, if this was our universe with a single inhabitant, this hand, if he goes to the right, he'll come out to the left, just like when we were on the torus, because those two edges marked A have been glued together. But now if he goes up, he will come down, uh, let me move this over so we can see a little better, he will come out, from the bottom, up. but notice what happened. Not only does he come out in a different place, sort of the opposite place, or, um, but his, his right hand became his left hand. The orientation shifted. So again, this is an example, and this has been discussed before, of a non-orientable uh, space. Um, if we lived on the surface of a Klein bottle, we wouldn't have a good global notion of orientation. Um, uh, here we're playing tic tac toe again, I guess. And again, the computer beat me because it, it uh, formed a line on the Klein bottle. Okay. Let's make the jump to three dimensions. So
So let, of course, the simplest three-dimensional shape is three-dimensional Euclidean space. It's simplest is not the right word. But it's, 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 it's the shape that we learned about back in high school, described globally in terms of three coordinates, x, y, and z. But let me discuss an example of a shape that it, it excuse me, the, the three dimension of Euclidean space is an example of an infinite. But let me instead discuss a couple examples of uh, spaces that we be finite or compact. So I'll study with a three dimensional torus. And it's called a three dimensional torus because it's constructed very much like our tor the torus was, where the torus was constructed by taking a square and gluing together the opposite edges. Here we will take a solid three-dimensional cube and glue together the opposite faces. The cube has six faces, each of which is a square, and we'll glue them together. So first, we'll glue the top to the bottom, then we'll glue the right to the left, and then the front to the back. Now it's difficult to kind of draw a picture that we can get our heads around, but that doesn't stop us from, do, from doing geometry and topology in this situation. And again, to get um, a good handle or feel for it, what it would be like, we're going to use another piece of software. By the way, this software was all uh, written by a mathematician named Jeffrey Weeks, who's a topologist who's from um, Ithaca College in New York, and you've got this wonderful software uh, that I will, as I said before, I'll give you a link to. All right, so let's uh, pretend we're traveling in space um, in a free torus. So our model for the universe now is, a, is the free torus. We're going to have only one planet in our space, namely Earth. But let's imagine what we will see if we look out into space. So what you're looking at now is a depiction of this uh, original cube. We're in the interior of the cube. And we colored the uh, walls of that cube uh, yellow. And we're traveling in a spaceship. Let's go in this direction. Are we traveling? Yeah. And I'm going to open some windows. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. We lost Earth. <laughs> there it is. And I'm going to open up some windows. And oh, right, it looks like we're going to crash. So that's okay. And we come out, and, and you see here, I'll, I'll put it back a little bit. If you look to the right, you see to the left. If you look up from the North Pole, you will see the South Pole. So let me uh, remove the walls entirely. And if we look up in, this, in, in the sky, living in this universe that had only one planet, we would still have the illusion that we see infinitely many planets. But we're seeing the same Earth, but from different points in time. And it would have this beautiful symmetry to it, coming from the symmetry, the geometry, the topology of the free torus itself. So this is all fun, but um, now we have to ask, how can we tell what, if the three torus is a good model for the universe we live in or not, or if it has to be some other geometric shape? Well, suppose we were looking in an optical telescope and we had perfect vision. We can see forever. What would we see? Well, first of all, we'd be looking back in time, as we've already discussed. We'd see nearby galaxies, stars nearby, more or less as they are now, or now mean within the last couple thousand years. You look further back, millions of light years away, you will see uh, stars and galaxies forming. You will see clouds of hydrogen dust, more nebula as we started with. And further back still, we see primarily just the dust. And if we look 13 or so billion light years away, 
we will see an opaque plasma, a primordial plasma. Most um, astrophysicists, astronomers believe that the Big Bang happened on the order of 14 billion years ago. So this primordial plasma exists um, 13 billion light years away. So we really, um, in relative terms, fairly close to the beginnings of the universe. It's opaque, it means that it, it, you can't see through it. In fact, there's an interesting question. Can you really see it at all? Well, it turns out the answer is both yes and no. So um, it, it turns out that the radiation that's received in, uh, from this primordial plasma is not light. So we really couldn't see it from an optical telescope. After all, if you had a perfect telescope and you looked up in the sky, the space between the stars and galaxies would appear black. But rather, the radiation that's received from that primordial plasma from 13 billion light years away comes to us as microwaves. Microwaves are just very much like the uh, radiation that's produced in, your, in the, your microwave oven in your kitchen. It's a kind of a radio wave uh, at, at a very high frequency. So even though we wouldn't see anything with an optical telescope, no matter how good, if you had a radio telescope, you wouldn't see blackness between uh, the stars and galaxies. You would see a faint glow that was fairly uniform in all directions. So th this was discovered in the 1960s. Um, it's called the Cosmic Microwave Background. It was discovered by astronomers Arno Penzias and, and Robert Wilson, and they, they received the Nobel Prize for this discovery. And they discovered it and detected this, uh, this radiation in radio telescopes. Of the sort you see uh, it, it fairly regularly. There's, there's one in the hills behind uh, uh, my own university that um, can detect this type of radiation. Now from these uh, microwaves that come from this primordial plasma, you can detect certain fluctuations in the density of that plasma. It's not entirely uniform. There are fluctuations in the, in the density um, that are due to, uh, uh, that cause temperature fluctuations. So what would you expect to see in terms of those fluctuations? Well, here's a, a, a kind of a, a cartoon picture. If the universe was infinite in size, you would expect these fluctuations to be rather random, and fluctuations to be all over the board. But if it was compact, finite in size, no matter how huge, you might see patterns, just like we saw the patterns um, in this hypothetical universe that was shaped like a free torus, which is compact, that only had one planet in it, but we saw this beautiful symmetry and the, the patterns that that symmetry gave us. So you'd expect to see patterns, as this is uh, meant to show. You see uh, this grouping of four here repeating itself and so forth. So can you actually see such patterns? Well, in 2001, NASA sent up a radio telescope on a satellite uh, called the uh, Wilkinson Microwave Anisotra Peak Pro, and uh, they put it in orbit around the sun in synchronization, in sync with uh, the Earth's orbit, and they received data from the cosmic microwave background for nine years. So they, they totaled nine years of data, and they studied many, many aspects of the um, of the micro background, including the, um, the, the shape of the universe. And they found, indeed, there were patterns in the density fluctuation. Now, unfortunately, Mother Nature doesn't give us the walls that we had in that cube that were glued together so we knew that we had a three torus. So you have to try to figure out what those patterns say about the geometry and the topology of the universe. And many theoretical physicists and mathematicians, including um, 
uh, William Thurston, one of the really great mathematicians of the last 50 years, uh, studied this carefully, and they found, now it doesn't fit a three torus, we don't live in a three torus, but there is something similar that it does fit reasonably well. And that's a, a, what's called a Poincaré dodecahedron space. So it's very much like a three torus, in, in that a three torus, you started with a solid cube and glued opposite faces together. Here you start with a dodecahedron, a solid dodecahedron. So it's a three-dimensional solid shape. Um, it has 12 faces and they are all pentagons. And now you glue the opposite penta pentagon faces together. And to do that, in order to get the vertices to align up, you have to give it a little bit of a twist. And that's called, and it, and it results in a three-dimensional manifold. And the idea was that the symmetry, such a uh, shape, would give us, is a reasonable model for what was found in that data coming from that satellite. So again, I can't resist. Let's do a little space travel, except um, we'll change our space to a Poincaré the decahedral space. And here we are. Let me uh, put the walls in. So again, now we're traveling in the interior of that dodecahedron. These walls really aren't there. They're just cover, uh, colored to uh, help us understand the geometry. And so I'll, I'll start removing those walls or putting windows in them. Again, hypothetically, there's only one planet. You'll also see a spaceship. This is. This is the spaceship we're traveling in. But you see it many times because, uh, you know, the universe is finite in this, in this picture. And let me um, finally remove all the walls. And this is what the sky would look like if one had perfect vision and we lived in a concrete dec dodecahedral space. Again, the illusion that there are infinitely many planets, but we're looking at um, the Earth many, many times for many uh, points in time. And we're also looking at our spaceship. So do we live in a um, in a Poincaré dodecahedron space? Well, not so fast. The geometry suggests that it's pretty close. But we know more about the universe than, the, than just the, the geometry that's determined by that um, <clears throat> Uh, the, the density fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. We know something about the forces like, like gravity and uh, electricity, magnetism, and so forth. And for example, Einstein's gravitational field equations tell us that um, gravity is very much intertwined with the geometry of the universe we live in. So you can plug in the geometry. And, and the aspect of the geometry uh, that's most relevant is curvature. So you can plug in the curvature that's determined by Poincaré to neutral space, and unfortunately it doesn't fit. So, um, you know, we're not done. The story is not over. But um, the moral of the story is, well, what do we know about the shape of the universe? Is it finite? Is it infinite? Well, I think there's evidence that says it's, it's compact. It's, we don't have a proof, but there's evidence. Um, uh, it has very little curvature, that's known. Uh, most theories now involve four dimensions, not looking for just the shape of a three-dimensional object. In fact, many theories, like string theory, involves as many as 10 or even 11 dimensions. So there's many different approaches to uh, understanding the geometry. So, so there's plenty of work to do in the future. Uh, so I will end here. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, uh, if I may, I promise to give you references. So let me uh, put that back up on the screen. These are the references that I used for this lecture. Um, I used two books, 
One is, uh, was written actually by a colleague of mine, a former colleague of mine, Robert Osterman, called The Poetry of the Universe, A Mathematical Exploration of the Cosmos. A uh, beautiful book. Um, it, both of these books are non-technical. One learns some mathematics, but um, you know, one learns ideas more. And then um, a book where I got more direct reference uh, was, uh, it's called, and it's a more modern book, called The Shape of Space by Jeffrey Weeks. He's the same person who developed that uh, software. And those games are all un uh, available on his website. It's just uh, called geometrygames.org. And, and all the software that I played with today, it's available for free there. Any questions for Rob? No pregunta ya está. Yo les voy a hacer dos preguntas. La primera, ¿cómo es posible que con una ecuación se pueda dar la forma del universo? Una. La otra. Um, I, I don't. I don't believe you can describe the shape of the universe with one equation. Um, even the, the rather simple uh, three-dimensional um, shapes that I described, uh, it would take several equations to uh, to identify them. But it's possible. It's possible. Help me here. Sí, o sea, me contesta que con una ecuación no es posible, pero con varias es posible. Well, we really don't know. We really don't know. Uh, if if it is uh, describable as a three-dimensional manifold, a compact three-dimensional manifold, then uh, that shape can be described by uh, by a finite number of equations. But we don't know the answer yet. La segunda. Eh, siempre que hemos escuchado que hubo un Big Bang, ¿cierto? We always compare it with, we know that there was a Big Bang. First, I should give a disclaimer. I'm not a physicist, <laughs> an astrophysicist in particular. I have real interest in it, and my work does touch on physics, uh, but I am by no means an expert. But yeah, I, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> I think there's a lot of evidence of the Big Bang. Yo sé por qué nadie se ha preguntado si hubiera varios Big Bangs. I'm not sure how to answer that, but a related question is, is there a unique universe caused by the Big Bang, whether it's one, or uh, could there be more than one? And one of the creators of the cosmological theory of inflation is an astrophysicist at Stanford, and I happen to know him pretty well, and I had uh, the great opportunity to have many discussions with him. And he's of the belief that the Big Bang created what's called a multiverse, not a universe. And, um, uh, and that, you know, it's, it's hard to prove either mathematically or physically, but um, there's a lot of work that's attracting a lot of attention to see if um, theories of the geometry of the universe can be made um, consistent with that. Gracias. Bueno. 
más o menos detectar geométricamente de alguna de las otras fuerzas de la naturaleza? Eh, Well, of course, one of the great goals in theoretical physics is to develop a unified theory that describes all the four forces in the universe in a, um, in a uh, unified way. But, but having said that, there exist, for example, <coughs> classical equations like Maxwell's equation that describe electricity and magnetism uh, in terms of curvature. Not necessarily the curvature coming from a metric in geometry, but a, a curvature coming um, from what's called a gauge field. Um, so the answer is yes, but the um, story is certainly not complete uh, by any means. And, it's, and as I say, one of the driving forces in theoretical phys physics, and it has been for 90 years or so. How can you explain to a physicist that you drop the time to get the three-dimensional universe that you mentioned? Uh, I'm not sure I understand quite your question. Would you repeat that? Uh, bueno. How can you explain to a physicist uh, in physics the, the idea is a four-dimensional space-time, and yes. you are dealing with a three-dimensional universe. Where is the time? How can we explain to a physicist? This, this is, if you like, a slice. You, you know, if, if you imagine um, a loaf of bread, and you slice that loaf of bread, that loaf of bread is three-dimensional, and you slice it, and you look at the shape of the slice, that's now two-dimensional. So if you imagine the universe is, is four-dimensional, where you integrate time into the geometry, and you slice it, um, you're looking at a three-dimensional piece. Uh, the, the way time entered the discussion here was just in terms of the, um, of the, of the magnitude of the universe and the, and the time it would take light to travel from one point in the universe to another so that we can detect things um, optically. Um, but, but, but I mean, you're asking a very valid question and most um, theories of the geometry in the universe involve four dimensions and this, from that perspective, this should be viewed as a three-dimensional slice of that. We, we know that that black hole is a spot in the universe that we capture anything that, that happens to pass by between the um, light beams. So I have a twofold question. The first one is, according to your exposition on density fluctuations, uh, is there a limit to the value of density within the black hole? And the second question is, if uh, density were to be infinite within the black hole, and how could that be without uh, destroying the balance of the universe? Uh, it, it, those are fascinating questions, and it's just way beyond my expertise. Um, I, I, I honestly don't know if, uh, and it's a, even, it, it's a very good question with mathematical implication. Does the geometry, if the geometry of the universe is a finite, compact, three-dimensional manifold, does that have an effect on the, gra on the gravity in a black hole? Um, I don't know the answer. I, I just don't know. It's a very good question. Usted ha hablado de la forma del universo, pero a escala grande. ¿Qué puede comentar sobre la forma del universo? Muy pequeño, escala muy pequeña. Gracias.
again, um, <laughs> I, know, I know very little about this other than what is quite, quite interesting. Yeah, I, I'm a mathematician. What's quite interesting mathematically is uh, very similar mathematics comes up in, in, in the study of, um, uh, of uh, fundamental particles, particle physics, as it does in studying the geometry uh, of the universe as a whole. Um, the study of how they interact and you know how um, uh, really the topology of manifolds is inter integral in both of those studies. So mathematics is very much related. Um, the physics of what um, uh, particle, the question of what particle physics will teach us about the geometry of the universe, I can't answer. Y nos vemos a las 4 de la tarde de regreso después del almuerzo.